Okay, welcome back. Just to kind of remind you on our journey, our 10-point journey, uh, we've already done the clear line of sight. So we showed you what that looks like and how that connects from the, from the very beginning of the drug program into the validation. Um, next thing we want to look at is how do you really do the quality risk management? It's a good idea, but practically, how do you do that? So the things that I want to focus you on is we usually use the way that we, we found, and this is what I think is a best practice, is to use a series of templates uh, for organizing this information. So let me show you, this is in your slide deck, and I'm going to show you the exact templates that we normally use for a drug program. So we have a series of Excel-based templates that we use to, to manage this. So this one, uh, this template does two things. It identifies the TPP and the QTPP. So these are the first two elements on this. And I apologize to the people in the back uh, <laughs> that are our translators. I want them, the translators to sit up front, but I guess they have no choice, huh? Um, so I'll try to make this as big as I can so that they can see it as well from the back and maybe you guys in the back also of the room. It would be good for you. So first of all, a target product profile is not submission in the submission. It's more for the internal management of the drug program. It's more for the marketing team. It's more for the senior leadership of the organization to keep things kind of organized and clear. And you're going to see that there's a direct connection between the TPP and the QTPP. Now, in our templates, anything, let me just show you uh, down here on the bottom, anything that's in yellow is a QTPP element. Again, that has to be filed and submitted. So what are all the things that you should have? And again, the purpose of the QTPP is to, the purpose of the QTPP is to define drug program requirements. So that's the purpose. And with those set of requirements, you can see whether or not we're meeting those requirements as we do the drug development. Normally, you would have something that would talk about efficacy. So again, I'll just go through the, not, I'm not trying to do the full training on this, but just give you an idea what we'd normally include. So it would have things like clinical endpoints for efficacy, onset of action, duration of action, PK and bioavailability. So the PK and the bioavailability is mandatory. It's a mandatory part of the submission to the agencies in the drug filing. So that one has to be submitted and any other MOAs. And then safety, tolerability, adverse event, contraindications, warnings or precautions. So anything over here relating to safety. Health outcomes. What, uh, oh, sorry, up here at the very beginning. What's the population? What is the indication? What's its intended use? The intended use and the indication is also mandatory. That has to be filed. So what is it that we want that drug to be able to do? And what are the target populations? Is it for children? What ages? Is it for adults? What ages? Is it for uh, seniors or older people? So what populations is this specifically targeted for? And then a lot of the CMC things are here. So what treatment? Would the form be in? Is it a cream? Is it a tablet? Is it an injectable? Uh, what is it that we're making? Um, it, what's the treatment regimen? How often would they be getting an injection? How often would they be taking the tablet? What's the length of treatment? What's the duration that the person, patient would use this? What dosage or strengths would we need it in? And are there a range of doses that we're doing? Now, this is where it would hit CNC, uh, CMC quite a bit. Because if I'm designing the drug for a single dose, or in, particularly in formulation, if I'm designing the formulation for a range of doses, and what if I don't know what the final dose is going to be until phase two exit? Then I know what the dose needs to be. So really characterizing a QBD approach to formulation is really cool because instead of characterizing everything to a single dose, we're doing dose ranging in the stability. And we're characterizing that range of doses so at the end of the day, somebody could say, oh, well, we're going to set that up for uh, 300 units, or we're going to set that up for 200 units. But we characterize between 100 and 500 units in the dose. Now, 
whatever the clinicians need, we've already got that work done, and we can tell you what the stability of the drug is in any dose range that we might be using because we just didn't characterize a single dose. We did it for a dose range, and now when the clinic knows what they like, the CMC is ready. This is a huge idea. And traditional formulators don't do it this way at all. They'll do a formulation for a 200-unit drug. They'll do a formulation for a 400-unit drug. That's it. Have a nice day. And then, but what if 350 looks like it should be the right one? I don't know. So, bad idea. So, we want to make sure when we're formulating, we do the formulation properly. And in the API concentration, we've done the dose ranging. So, we can use QBD to justify a new dose schema within the characterized dose range. Big idea. Big, big idea. Okay, so those dosage strengths, we got to understand what that is. And even if we're not sure what that is, we need to do dose ranging so that we can be flexible and support a range of doses. Um, okay, mode of administration. So how is that uh, to be administered? And then stability. What are you designing this for? Is this for four years shelf life? Is this for one year shelf life? Is this for six months? What is this for? What do you think is the stability targets that we're trying to shoot for? And that, again, will completely change how I do formulation and how I do the characterization of that drug product or drug substance. Storage conditions, fill sizes, primary packaging, all of those go in. These are all QTPP elements that need to be defined. So here's your line of sight. Watch how I establish line of sight. So you'll also notice that I say target, optimal, and minimal. So I might say that my target is I want to have a lyophilized drug product. That's what I want. I want it lyophilized. But while I'm doing the development, my optimal or my minimum is I'll leave it liquid. So I'll go ahead and keep it in liquid form, but ideally I'd like to have it lyo. So things like that, right? What would be... or I'm going to do them in uh, filled vials, but really, optimally, I'd like to be in pre-filled syringes. So again, what is it that would be your, your best solution? What would be the minimum that you would have to do? And then we can decide phase appropriate, whether it would be time, when would it be appropriate to start working on pre-filled syringes? When would it be appropriate to do liquid in vial? When would it be appropriate to change our development strategy. So that allows us a little bit of flexibility and lays out what that is. Are there any competitors in the marketplace for the products that we're working on? In many cases, we're working on competitive products. It is maybe a little bit different. Maybe it has slightly different uh, onset of action. Maybe it has slightly different efficacy. Maybe it has slightly different potency. So there may be a reason why your drug needs to be in the marketplace where there's similar products. So what is that market difference? What would make your product different than other people's products? And then what is your competitive advantage? Now we'll roll right over with that and roll right into the QTPP. So again, what are the exact targets? What are the requirements that we're going to require for that? And then what is the development approach? How are we going to get there? So we're going to use proven technology. We're going to, what approach are we going to be using to develop that? Are we going to use existing processes? Are we going to use a new method? What are we doing here? So how are we going to approach that? And now the next final one for our line of sight is I would like to know if that's the key quality attribute that's important, how are you going to be measuring that? So what is this key CQA that we need to measure? And what are all the CQAs that we would be doing? Um, what would be the upper and lower specification limits for that? Uh, what would be your control method or control point? What would be your analytical or test method? So now I can, in one picture, I can see the TPP, I can see my CQAs, I can see my uh, QTPP all in one view. So this is a template that we use. Now, the agency said that when you submit that information to it, we want it in tabular form, table form. So an Excel spreadsheet is a perfectly acceptable table form to submit. So you can have those in a nice worksheet, properly labeled, properly identified. What did the agencies have to say about that? Well... In one of the key questions, they said, this is from the FDA itself, there was a question submitted to them, can the FDA clearly define what is wanted 
in the submission of a QTPP. Show us what do you want. So again, I see this is one of their slides, not my slides, theirs. Uh, let's see what it says. It says QTPP ICHQ8 forms the basis of the design and development of the product. It should tell us about the intended use. I said that. Road of administration. I said that. Dosage. I said that. And dosage range. Delivery systems, strengths, container closures, release or delivery of active and attributes affecting PK and quality criteria. Simply stated, QTP is a predetermined set of targets based on the intended use of the product under development with respect to knowledge and characterized of the use conditions. So that's what they have to say about QTPP. And again, uh, if you go online and Google it, you can also see different submission examples that people have. Uh, Pfizer uh, leaves one up on the website that you can take a look at. It's not bad to look at. There's lots of people that put them up, so you can take a look at that. Now, next thing we want to take a look at is the CQAs. How do you, should you organize and communicate the CQAs? So again, all these templates uh, you can get copies of. So this is what we typically use for the CQA. So we have a template. I'll show you the big picture first, and then we'll zoom in a little bit. So this is a template that we use. There's usually two of these. One of them is for drug substance, and the other one is for drug product. So if we get into this a little bit, this lays out. So this, and remember that we want a risk-based approach. So this is going to do both the definition and the risk assessment. So we're going to get both of these done through this template. So the first thing it says is, all right, what are the different kinds of quality attributes you might have? So the first group is what we call default. These are by definition CQAs. They're not because you want them to be, it's because the health authorities have already told you, you must measure DNA. You must measure whole cell proteins. You must measure endotoxins. You must measure impurities. You mu must measure morphology. So whatever are the attributes of your drug that are compendial, no choice. So those are the first ones that we're going to list under CQA. So those are what I call default or compendial. The second thing that we need to do is, OK, fine. What is the drug quality attribute that we're trying to measure here? What is that attribute? So we list it. Which analytical method specifically are we using at our company that will measure that attribute? So is it a uh, what, what kind of columns are we using? Is it HPLC method? Is it an ELISA method? Uh, what type, is it a biological method? So what type of assay or analytical method can measure that attribute? What's our experience with that? So what do we know about that? Is that based on uh, prior knowledge? Is that based on clinical understanding? So we've got a bunch of different drop, is that based on public literature? Is that based on platform approach? We always do it, so we're just using kind of our platform approach to that. So what's your prior knowledge about measuring that attribute? Are you using a compendial method uh, that you can use uh, for that? So those are well-defined and um, documented. What's the purpose of this? Uh, let me talk about the risk in just a minute. Let me continue on with the different kinds of CQAs we might measure. The next group are what I call the characteristics of the active. So any uh, molecular characteristic, protein characteristics, any key attribute of that particular uh, API. So what are key attributes of the active that you're planning on measuring? What additional additives are you going to be putting into solution? Buffering systems, um, other additives such as surfactants, uh, antioxidants, other kinds of additives that you might be putting into solutions. Um, to, as stabilizers, as uh, things to protect the molecule, thermal stabilizers, sugars, salts, whatever those might be, what are the other additives that you're looking at putting in there. And again, there's one for DS, and there's a separate one for DP. So drug product gets its own, drug substance gets its own. So we set that up. Now, what are the other impurities or residuals that you might be measuring? How are you going to be measuring those? Peak areas, high molecular weight species, low molecular weights, other kinds of impurities that you might be looking for, uh, peak areas that you might be looking at, percentages that you might be looking at, what are those, and what's the nature of those impurities that you're planning on measuring? How are you going to be assessing potency? Is that going to be uh, 
how are you going to be measuring the activity of the molecule relative to the other characteristics? So what is that, what bioassay are you going to be using? What analytical or test method? Or is it, is it uh, cell-based? Is it animal-based? How are you going to be measuring activity? And then uh, what does your container closure system look like? What key attributes are you going to look at there for moisture, for other kinds of uh, impurities, particle reading? Uh, there's a big emphasis on particles and particle distributions. So what does that look like? And then finally, how are you going to be measuring things under storage and transportation? So this should give you the questions for the CQAs. And again, we would fill that out. Now, to determine whether it's a CQA, we're arguing that the reason why it's a CQA is because it has a direct bearing on safety and efficacy. So the next thing we do is saying, what do you think is its potential? And all these have a scoring systems down below. So if you want to see how we mapped out the scoring systems, they're all down on lower. But basically, does this thing, do you think it has an influence on safety? So again, the person can rate that or rank that by a ranking system that's d d defined down below. So very low influence on it, very high influence on it. And then what's your uncertainty? So if it's really well characterized in control, it's low risk. Even though it has high influence, it's well understood, it's well controlled, we're not going to have a problem, right? If you said, but what is your uncertainty? We don't really know what that's going to do. Uh-oh. What about your uncertainty? Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, oh no. So that's going to happen, right? Is we, we sometimes we, we know, sometimes we're not so sure. So what is your certainty of that? And again, we do our risk assessment. Then over here, we come back and we get a score for safety. Then we look at efficacy. Do you think this would likely affect the efficacy of the drug? Its potency, its activity, right? So by scoring those as well, you can decide, so... What's the, C, the CQA, the quality assurance risk? That's a quality attribute risk. Well, you can see in this example, that's mostly safety. It's not really much on efficacy. But on other cases, it might be hugely impacting the efficacy, and it's not well characterized or well understood, and the safety issues are minor. So again, each one of these gets scored, and from the scoring, we can identify which of these are going to be included. Now, the end of the day, we're going to rank these. We're going to tell the agencies, this is just for characterization only. We're not considering this a CQA. We'll still measure it. It'll be part of CMC. It'll be part of our development. It'll be a well-characterized molecule. But we're not going to put it in our release tests. It's not going into our release panel. It's just for information only during the development. So we're not saying we don't want to measure it. We will measure it, but we're not going to be using it as an ongoing CQA. So this helps us to differentiate. And then some of these people say, well, why don't you measure certain attributes? Well, we just thought that for that particular attribute, we're, it, we could measure it that way. We don't plan to. So that if later somebody says, how come you didn't consider this? Well, we did consider it. And here's our justification why we chose not to. We don't measure everything we can. We measure the things we must measure to meet our requirements to make sure it's safe and effective. What's your rationale? Why do you say that that's a CQA? Why do you say that that doesn't need to be measured? It's not acceptable to say this is the answer without giving some scientific rationale. Again, that rationale can be based on two things. It can be based on science. It can be based on experience. And remember that doing nothing is acceptable, but you have to explain why that's okay. Doing nothing is acceptable. You just have to explain why it's acceptable. So that's what we mean by a risk-based approach. By the way, that is stated in the guidance document for Q9. It says some risks are acceptable. You just have to explain why. Give us the scientific justification why that's OK. And then finally, there's one more thing you have to have, or it's not a CQA. And that is limits. A quality attribute with no limits is not a CQA. You must have operational limits. One of the big mistakes we see for drug programs is they say, we don't want to set limits until we get to phase three. Are you kidding me? Stop the craziness. So we want limits at phase one. 
it's perfectly okay with me that we set those limits pretty wide and we don't squeeze them down until we've got quite a bit of batch data. But initially, we want an initial, in many cases, people use what they call platform specs for an antibody program. These are typical limits for high molecular weight, for, a, uh, for looking at the morphology of a crystal. These are certain limits that we look for for the different types of polymorphs that we might be looking at So for small molecule. So we may use platform requirements until we get enough data to then lock down those limits for that particular drug program. So don't wait to define the limits. The minute you say it's a CQA, then the next question is, what are the operational limits for that quality attribute? Start wide, go narrow. When should the limits be well defined? By phase two exit, you should have all your limits set up. So phase one, as soon as you have the CQAs defined, all CQA should be defined in phase one. Must be defined in phase one. By phase one, you should have the defined CQA and all limits. By phase two exit, you should have the limits pretty well locked down. By phase three exit, those should be completely perfect. Will they change? Yes. Why? Data. Data, with the right data, you'll realize some of the limits you might have set aren't exactly right. In some cases, way too wide. Those can be much more narrow. And in some cases, you thought maybe this was OK, and you need to open those up a little bit. So, and then we keep a close eye on the clinic. What does the clinicians tell us they need as well? So the combination between clinical relevance and process control, we're tying those two together to make sure those limits are correct. The biggest mistake I see people making, they, and they call me, hey, Dr. Tom, can you help us? Yes. We're in phase three exit. OK. We're working on BLA. We don't have any limits. Can you help us? Oh my gosh. I don't want to help you. <laughs> I can help you. I don't want to help you. So it's really, uh, it's a terrible thing. Because it, it causes so many other problems in other parts of the filing that you're just going to look silly. So please, 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 just if you can write that down, phase two exit, we really want those limits pretty well defined. And when we get into that, it's going to help us on everything that we do. So process characterization is really should be done by phase two. By phase three, or all you're doing is just the confirmation runs and getting ready for validation. So we want to front load some of that work, but we want it to be very efficient. OK, so that's that. So here's these limits. You got my, uh, my story on setting those limits. They have to be there. If you know something about the process capability, put that in. Process capability refers to your potential failure rates. So if this is the specification, what percentage of the time would you likely fail that spec? Would that be less than 5%, less than 1%? Would that be 100 ppm? What, would, what do you think that would be? That's nice if you can put it in there. If you don't know it, fine. Is there any other orthogonal method that can be used to measure the same property? Um, if so, what would it be? If not, then there is none. So this is your CQA. This is also part of the filing. Uh, we've had direct feedback from both FDA and EMA on this template. And the feedback was they really liked it because in one place, they could see all of the CQAs. They could see why we considered it a CQA, the limits and rationale. Everything was one place. Copy, paste, report, send it. So this is uh, these templates. I wish I could tell you I developed all these templates. I did not. I helped to develop these templates. I did not develop them entirely. We worked with hundreds of CMC teams around the world using these templates. They gave us feedback. This is good. This needs to be changed. This is good. This needs to be changed. And we, as we worked with them, you're looking at maybe the 10th or 15th revision of these templates. So again, they're used by lots of drug companies. Uh, every once in a while, a drug company will tell me, hey, Tom, we don't want to use your templates. We want to use ours. I go, can I see yours? They show it to me. I go, yours are not good. And they go, oh, come on. Ours are good. And I said, take a look at this carefully. Look, see what this does. And see what yours templates do. That's not really right. They'll look at it and go, oh, yeah, you're right. So I'm not saying that I'm so proud of this. I'm saying this is really 
as far as I know, and no one has shown me something better. These, because if they show me something better, I'll use their good idea. So this is constantly being updated. We maintain these, and they're used by CMC teams globally, and you're all welcome to have a copy. So, and you don't have to thank us. Just use it. If you're finding it useful, that's our pleasure. Makes us happy. Us, me, me, me and the people that work with me. Okay, uh, next bit. So that's kind of our, how we do the CQAs. And again, we have a separate one for drug product. We talked about all that. We talked about high-level risk assessments. Again, the value of the high-level risk assessment. And let's take a, a more detailed look at a high-level risk assessment. I guess that's the next thing we should take a really good, good look at. So... On this template, this, is, uh, this happens to be a drug substance one. As I mentioned, if I was working on biologics, it's almost always there's three of these. One for cell culture, one for purification, and one for formulation, fill, and finish. So usually there's three of them. For a small molecule, I've had as many as five of them, but it's usually three or four is typical. So uh, if there's more than that, I don't understand what people are doing. So again... The logic is it, first of all, takes all the unit ops and helps to organize those. So let's take a look at the form and see how it does that. And to me, this is the magic. If this is done really, really well, this is what speeds up the whole program and really makes the cost of development go way down. So this is my uh, favorite tool in doing uh, modern drug development and following the Q9 guidance for using risk assessments. So the first thing is, what is the CMC activity? What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the risk you're trying to assess? Uh, and what are the unit ops in, included in here? So the first thing we do is we relist. So again, watch this, line of sight, right? So you can see it. So again, QTPP to CQAs. Now CQAs to unit ops. So watch this. So I'm going to come on over here. I'm going to say, okay, for this, so if I was doing cell, let, let's do a cell culture example. I think uh, I, I was told that maybe 70% of you today are from biologics companies. So sorry, small molecule people. We love you too. Just not as much. No, not as many. Sorry, not as, not, not as much. Not as many. Um, so let me do, a, let me do a, a, a molecular or a biological example here for a moment. So the first thing I would do is if I was working on this and I said, okay, 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 I have my CQAs from drug substance. The first question would be, which of these CQAs is related to cell culture? Not all of them, because a lot of these don't even happen until later steps in the process. So which of these are cell culture? Or if I was working on purification, which of these would directly relate to purification? So I select, I might have 30 CQAs or 20 CQAs, but when I'm looking at purification, I'm only looking at four or five of them. Do you understand? So I want to take it from a big list of CQAs, and I want to really narrow that down to those that relate to cell culture, those that relate to purification, those that relate to formulation, fill, and finish. So I want to make sure that I've got that nice line of sight. Now I can, now I can really do this risk assessment efficiently. So I come on over here, and I say, okay, then these are the ones that I think are relating to cell culture. So I put them over here. Then I come over here and say, okay, fine. What are the limits? Is there an upper and lower limit? Is there a clear target that has been identified for that yet? You heard my story on targets. And then the next question is, how many unit ops are really in this sequence? So what is the name of each unit operation that the process goes through? And then how is that potentially impacting each one of these CQAs? So I could, I could tell you by, with the team, we can go in and lay, lay that out in a high, medium, low. And we, could, we have some definitions on what is high. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if it shifts the average by more than 20% of tolerance, then we consider that a high. If it's 10 to 20%, that's medium. Less than 10% would be low in most cases. If you want to write that down, shifting the process by more than 20% is generally considered a high effect. 
between 10 to 20 percent is a medium. Less than 10 percent is generally considered a low effect. And the reason why that's set that way is because of its potential impact on being out of spec, OOS. By the way, OOS in the eyes of the FDA has clinical relevance. Being out of specification has what, in considered by the FDA, has clinical relevance. So when we say that something will shift it by more than 20 percent, we're telling, we're making the claim that this potentially may have clinical relevance on that CQA. That's all we're saying. We're not saying more. So we then list that. If it's medium or high, it has to be risk assessed. If it's low, no need. So what if I find a unit op that this one has low, 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 low? So I say this just doesn't really impact any of these. It impacts, by the way, it might impact productivity. It might impact tighter. Does the FDA care about productivity? They don't call it productivity by design. They call it quality by design. Why do they call it that? Because they don't care about productivity. But who does? We do. We have to care about tighter. We have to care about cycle time. We have to care about productivity. Can we do productivity by design too? Sure. So normally in these risk assessments, we don't include productivity. But we have to be considering it in our work. Tighter, by the way, no tighter, no drug. No concentration, no drug. So at some point, some of these measures of productivity are important. But now I can tell you, I don't think we need to do a lot of development on unit operation three because it doesn't seem to have influenced these CQAs in any meaningful way. Does this make sense to you? And then I might say that this one could influence potentially multiple CQAs. Now it has to go through formal risk assessment. Now, if I identify that it has risk, it doesn't mean that I have to do anything yet. So now what I'm going to do is go in and do what we call a classic FMEA type risk assessment. So it's not really an FMEA exactly, but it follows similar logic. So again, we would identify the unit op. What's our baseline process? Are we making any changes? If we're making any changes to our traditional processing method, what's that difference? Uh, which CQA are you thinking about that needs to be assessed relative to which unit operation? So these are now listed. And then we go through the, the classic uh, evaluation of severity or influence to look at how influential that might be. We look at the classic uh, consider considerations of probability or what we call uncertainty. Like, what we don't know that. Like, how will this step in the process influence the CQA? We don't know. Well, if you don't know, the uncertainty must be very high. Don't you have prior knowledge? No. Don't you have process understanding? No. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Might as well be honest. Right? So, okay, fine. How about detectability? Can we measure it? Is it IPC? We have a measurement? No, we don't even measure it. Uh-oh. We got a lot of risk there. Right? So that identifies where we need development. Because we have a CQA that has a lot of uncertainty, a lot of influence, and not good measurement. We've got to do some characterization and control. So if we say it has high severity, but it has really, we really know how to do this. And we also have very good detectability. Then it's no, no problem. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. So we can then justify doing nothing might be perfectly OK. Doing something is mandatory. So this is our justification. This is the story we have to tell. Now, what some people have tried to do, and this is pretty crazy if you think about it, they tried to take all the unit operations and put them into one risk assessment. Temperature, time, pressure, flow. 250 lines of risk assessment. It's crazy. It makes no sense. So all we're asking is two things, CQA to unit op is, has an effect, no effect. It has uncertainty, no uncertainty. It has good detectability, poor detectability. So we just ask that. And then the answer that's going to come out of this risk assessment is these are the unit operations with risk. 
That's all we want to know. We don't want to know temperature, time, pressure, flow, concentration. We don't want to know that. We just want to know which unit operations need attention. Now, as a, in a submission package, this is so cool because we can then show line of sight. These are my QTPPs, CQAs, unit operations with risk, experimental strategy. Beautiful. What if I don't do that? Here's my experiments. Here's experiment one, experiment two, experiment three. Which ones did you need? I have no idea. What do you mean you have no idea? I have no idea which ones I need. These are the ones I did. Yeah, but are they the ones you need? I don't know. Stupid, stupid development. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Bad idea. How could you not know what you need? Because nobody sat down and thought through it carefully to make sure we have what we need. And when will you need it? When you try to file it, and then even more so when you go to make it. So this concept is such a simple idea, but this is where the efficiency and the magic happens, I think, on QBD. The difference between development groups that use this and don't, dramatic difference in what they do and how they do it and how fast they can move. It's speed, folks, speed. Speed of development is really controlled right here. Uh, if you're going to do something, what are you going to do? Uh, if I can use my Korean keyboard here. So I do a DOE, I add an IPC, right? So what are the risk reductions? Or maybe I do nothing. And then if you're going to do something, who's going to do it? When's it going to get done? Uh, if I do that, what's, what's it going to do to the risk? How will that change my risk scoring? And then what is your scientific or technical rationale or justification if the risk is acceptable? So why do you say it's okay to do nothing? So that has to be there. And then who has to review and approve this? So what other departments or groups need to look at that? You want QC, you want regulatory, you want anybody else to take a look at your, at your thinking? <clears throat> and then what's your de development priority? Is this a, a high priority thing? Is this a medium or low? So again, as I schedule things and put together my timelines, how do I want to schedule that? Or is this no development required? So those will, will help us to kind of get that all organized. Big deal. Oh, almost got to the right one. Uh, let's see, I need this one. There we go. Okay, so again, we've done the high-level risk assessment. <clears throat> of course, we must meet its friend, the low-level risk assessment. So let's take a quick look. Do you find this interesting at all? To see kind of how to lay out your drug program from the very onset. And you can see how QBD would definitely help in making these things clear. Okay, next thing is let's take, take a look at a low level. So this is done before any designed experiment is done. So let's take a look at that. And your, ch your chart is pretty small, so maybe not easy to see, but this one might be easier to look at. So now I'm going from a series of unit operations, starting from maybe cell culture to harvest, or starting from load to uh, final material. Uh, Siri, don't turn on. I'm going to turn Siri off so she cannot talk to me. She just said, I don't understand what you're saying. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> Siri is bad. Uh, stop, Siri. <laughs> I'll put her in my pocket. Maybe she'll go away. OK. So the next thing that we want to take a look at is this. So again, <coughs> CQA, unit op, multiple unit operations. Low level risk assessment, one unit operation. So I'm just looking at a single column. I'm looking at a single reaction. I'm looking at a single process step. I'm looking at filtration. I'm looking at a single step in the process. And now I'm ready for design of experiments. So here's where my DOE strategy is going to come in. So again, line of sight, CQA. 
So for this individual design of experiments, what are all the measures <coughs> that you're going to be using? So what specific CQAs do you need? So here are all the CQAs that I require. Now these can be both productivity and CQAs. So if I'm measuring titer, I'm measuring uh, yield, I'm measuring recovery, any of the key characteristics I'm interested in, um, I should have them all right here. So all the CQAs and all my productivity measures will be listed here. How important are those relative to each other? Is this more important than that? So I can do a, a ranking on the relative criticality or importance of these CQAs. Now I come down here and I start thinking about what are the factors that could be influencing it. And now I need to go through and look at all the potential factors that could touch it. So those could be key process steps, those could be equipment settings, those could be key materials, that could be sequence of addition or sequence of operation. So I'm going to now lay out all those over here and then I'm going to look at all the different factors that may come in. Now, the problem with design experiments is we have way too many factors and we have way too small number of tests that we can run. <clears throat> so the, one of the things that we need to do in the risk assessment is think our way through how do we identify those factors that will have the strongest impact on our product. So again, we're going to do the risk assessment. We're going to take each CQA and risk rank each one of those factors. From that, we're going to score those and also based on a defined operational range. Ay, ay, ay. Um, and also based on an operational range. So if it was temperature, we might say 32 degrees, but that's our baseline. But in the characterization experiment, we might go from 30 degrees, we might replicate the 34 degree condition, and we might take that all the way up to, um, I might take it up to 38 degrees. So whatever is the range that I want to look at. API concentrations, dose ranging, right? So what are the ranges that you think you need to look at? And then in that range, what do you think its influence is likely to be? <clears throat> the result of this is I should have a set of factors that have been selected that will help us to go in and do our work. So the, the question is, what are the factors? The answer is, these are the factors you need. The second tab checks out all the interactions. So if I say, I've got, temp I've got temperature, I've got time, I've got pressure, I've got concentration. So these are the factors I'm planning on experimenting with. These are the ones I want to characterize <clears throat> to map out the design space. So as I put those in, the next question is, is there potential for interaction? So might the time and the temperature interact with each other to give me a, a new result? So same thing over here. I would do the likelihood of that being a case, and then I would decide whether that's included or not. And then based on my score, I would make a decision on this is not going to be included. Uh, this could be included, maybe possible, and this one must be included in the study. So when I look at the study design, when somebody shows me the study design, I can go and look at the low-level risk assessment. These are all the factors you might consider. But these are the ones specifically we think are the most meaningful and the most likely to be beneficial. So those are the ones that we want to go pursue. Then and only then I'm ready to design my experiment. So line of sight. This is, uh, this is not mine. This is from <coughs> GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, uh, using the AMAB report. This is the one that they showed. Um, so this is not one that I did, but you can just see this is other people's kind of thinking the same thing, that they want to do a risk assessment. That's the high-level risk assessment. And then when they get into the low-level uh, characterization, they do another risk assessment. They don't label it as high-level and low-level. I think my strategy is a little more clear, but it's OK. And then finally, how do we look at the design space in conjunction with the control strategy? They've got that right. 
and then how do we do the validation, and then how do we mitigate risk throughout the life cycle to make sure that our control plans do what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> okay, number one, done. Number two, done. Hopefully my voice isn't number three, done. <laughs> it should hold out. Whenever I fly a lot internationally, airplanes tend to dry me out a little bit, so as long as I can whisper, I can do this. Okay, next one is product knowledge. So we've got clear line of sight, we've got our risk assessments, now we need product knowledge. <clears throat> now the real question is, what really is knowledge? How do you know you know something? Think about this. Yeah, I know. How do you know? What is knowledge? I know that. By the way, we have to tell the FDA and the EMA and KFDA and CFDA and all the DAs. <laughs> we have to tell them all that we have good understanding of the drug. So how do we tell somebody that we know something? So let's take a look at this because it's a big idea. Here is, I think, an easy way to kind of look at it or think about it. So first of all, personal belief. I think this is true or it should be so. How do you rate that? Is it useful? Is it useful to say, I think I know that, or I should know that? Is that useful? Yeah. Can I write that in a report? Yeah, I know. Trust me, I'm professional. I would never lie to you. Do you feel good about that, or you want something more? By the way, <clears throat> at the very height part is pure science. Pure science. We said when we know something, we say we know it based on experience or we based it on first order principles of science. Which ones does the FDA trust? Science? Personal experience? The answer is they trust neither. Both wrong. Wrong. Why? Why science? Science cannot be wrong. Yeah, it can. Data is what they trust. Measurement is what they trust. So if you can't show it in measurement, it's not trusted. You might, so risk assessment, science is fine. Risk assessment, experience is fine. But when it comes to the filing, you must have data. People say, in God we trust. Everybody else, data please. <laughs> right? Everybody else bring data. So in U.S., we don't say in Trump we trust. It doesn't work too well for us. <laughs> We're, we learn every day something new about our president. But anyway, okay. <laughs> I, I, I always say uh, the last election was so interesting, right? We had a choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Wow. <laughs> I, I couldn't choose which one do I not like, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. We ha the good news for us, every four years we get to try again. So maybe it turns out better next time. We'll see. So you guys have your own stuff too. So, <laughs> Okay. So when we talk about knowledge, we have kind of, think of it as a bit of a pyramid. Down here on the low end, we have what we call heuristic rules or rules of thumb. And we have historical data where we pick the winner. Pick the winner is a terrible, terrible way of doing work. So again, pick the winner means I tried, try, 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 and this seems to be better than that solution. So that strategy is not good. And the problem is, is it's considered medium to low level. It's, a, it's medium risk and low levels of knowledge. You can't say you really know it. Why not? What's wrong with picking the winner? What's wrong with picking the winner? You don't know what made it good and by how much. So that's not considered high levels of knowledge. That's considered low levels of knowledge. It's better than nothing, but it's nothing's cousin. It's nothing's best friend. It's not nothing, but it's not much more. 
Okay, let's go up here to empirical models and equations. This is the name of the game. This is what we're seeking for. This is what we want. So we want an equation. If you can express knowledge in the form of an equation, you know something. So I would write a little note to yourself. Knowledge must be in the form of an equation. And that equation must be submitted. When you can submit your information about your drug development in an equation, you know what you're talking about. If you cannot submit it in an equation, you don't really know. And I'll show you an example. I'll show you examples. Okay. Um, this is just kind of a list for you of the different kinds of information that we're going to be putting together into our submission packages. So again, information, product knowledge is really focused on a couple of key characteristics. Product knowledge is focused on formulation. It's, uh, it's focused on PK and clinical. And it's focused on your analytical methods and your molecular and your molecule characterization. That's it. Formulation, PK and clinical response, and understanding the analytical methods that you can measure the, the mo molecule with, the drug with. Okay, again, this is just the example of the old versus the new. In the old world, the formulation seems to work okay. If you talk about, for, by the way, if you go to a formulator and you ask the formulator to formulate for you, you know what they do? They pull out the last formulation that seemed to work pretty well and say, this is your new formulation. Have a nice day. That's a, well, that's okay if it works. But then how do you know that that's working? Well, we have a platform. Well, platforms have to be characterized too. So old school formulation works, API is effective, Drug safe, drug stable, process is good, analytical method is good, variation is acceptable, and we can control by testing and compliance. But today, if you follow the QBD approach, then we have to explain more about that. So it's what makes the formulation work? How much? What's the target? What makes it stable? Which constituents exactly changes the degradation rate so let me say that one more time. Which constituents exactly influence the degradation rate of the drug? So that would tell you what makes it stay. This influences the rate by how much? If you can tell me that, you know it. What influences the bias or accuracy of the repeatability of the test method? Uh, where does the variation come from in the drug substance or drug product? What are the critical process parameters? What are the critical material attributes? And what are your feed forward, feedback, and in situ controls. So there's the old, there's the modern. If you can say honestly that your drug development, your CMC team today is really good at this bottom part, you are, you are world class, you're as good as anybody in the world at how to develop a drug. If you can say that that's not probably true on how we do drug, your submissions are at risk. These are just a few definitions just to help you a little bit. So this is again, this is right out of ICHQ6. So this is what is their definition of quality. Uh, ICHQ, Q6A and Q6B, I don't know if you look at those, but those are the uh, guidance that tell you how to set specs. And setting specifications is one of the keys to QBD. So really knowing what the guidance talks about there is very, very important. Uh, here's their definition of a CQA. So let's take a look at that. A physical, chemical, biological, or microbiological property or characteristic that should be within an appropriate limit, range, or distribution. So you notice that it has two parts. It has two parts. First part, it has to be a, a, an attribute. Second part must be within a defined limit. If you don't have the limits, it's not a CQA. So that's just one of the key concepts we have to reinforce. There is a lot of people today that try to do drug development with no limits. And that is such a mistake, such a mistake. So you don't want to do that at the last minute. OK, the design space. This is not my definition. This is Q8. So let's, let's see what they say. <clears throat> the multidimensional. Wow, 
I, I hope your translation in, in Korean is very good for that one. Uh, most people would not consider that word the right word. It should be the multi-factor. The multi-factor combination and interaction. I already showed you about interactions. And input variables and process parameters that have been demonstrated to provide the assurance of quality. So this is the range by which you're sure that it has good performance. Working within the design space is not considered as a change. Now, remember they had, the FDA had to give you a design space if they expected you to do process control. So let's think about process control for a second. Let's imagine for a moment, just think with me for a moment, let's imagine that temperature is your most critical factor. That temperature control is what makes the reaction or what makes the, the protein expression. It's all about the temperature, let's say. Now, the process drifts and it moves a little bit. What are you gonna do to control it? If you know that temperature can move it back, that would be a good control strategy. But you can't change the temperature in a traditional manufacturing process. But in a QBD filing, you can. As long as you define that range, you've characterized that range, and you can show that it's controllable in that range. That's what a design space is for, is to provide that window of characterization to justify making adjustments in that range. Making adjustments out of that range is not acceptable. Making adjustments in that range is acceptable if you have it filed. Now they say, they tell you a little bit more about it. They said um, normally regulatory approval would be pro uh, design spaces proposed by the applicant and is subject to regulatory assessment and approval. So let me just say one more thing about design spaces. Every characterization study you ever do will generate a design space. It will do it 100% of the time. But only a small set of those should be filed. Please write this down because this is a key concept. You, every experiment you ever do will create a design space. But only a small percentage of those you may choose to file as part of your control strategy. Think about this for just a second. How many parts are in a car? How many parts? If you own a Hyundai or a Kia or whatever you drive, or you take public transportation, if you drive a car, how many parts? A bicycle has 2,000 parts. A car has millions of parts. If you take every component, every piece of that car, and you lay it out on the table or count them all, it would be all, almost a million parts or in a car. That's why we have to pay the money for the car. They're not cheap because you're buying all these parts. But when you drive the car, how many controls do you really use? Think about it. Steering wheel, right? This controls. What? What does it control? Direction, right? Gas and brake. This controls momentum, right? And then your transmission, that controls forward or backwards. And power or pushing the button, right? Turns on the power. Five controls, you can drive. Even though it's very complicated. When we think about cell culture, purification, when we think about making a vaccine, when we think about making a small molecule and doing a, a reaction of some sort, creating a, a molecular synthesis, we do these processes, creating a vector and inoculating, a, transvecting a cell. We need a few steering wheels. You can't, this concept of you set up the process, you line everything up, and you never change it is crazy. You can't process this way. You need a few steering wheels. This is what the FDA had in mind when they said quality by design. Enhanced process control. Design space to give you a wider window so you can steer. Mm. Why do you need to steer? What's root cause? We don't need investigation. Just make the correction. 
bring it back to target and keep processing. This is the idea, and this is what people today are doing. They don't require you to file a design space. You must request it. And if it makes sense that you need it for control, you can have it. That's what they were thinking. I can prove it to you. Later, I'll show you an ICH guidance. It lays this all out and explains where the design space factors in and why it's part of process control. Big, big idea. Lunch is almost here. Give me a few more minutes, and I'll, I will we'll take you forward to lunch. I, used to, I don't know about Korea. I always take lunch at noon. So when somebody tells me lunch is at 1 o'clock, I get, as, as the time between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock gets closer, my happy factor goes, <laughs> my energy's going, so if you're feeling it too, uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> okay, um, again, these are right out of the guidance, so formal experimental design. This is from Q8. Uh, they say that it's a structured, organized method of determining relationships between factors. You can't do drug development today if you don't know how to do DOE design of experiments. So this is one of our key strategies. Your CMC team needs to be not good at doing this, it needs to be excellent in doing it. Because DOEs have to be done, must be done, in formulation, in analytical methods, and process, unit op. So those are three places we must, if you're not doing design of experiments on formulation, you're not formulating correctly. If you're not doing design of experiments on analytical methods, you're not following Q2 guidance for analytical method development and validation. Robustness testing has to be DOE. And then if you're not using design of experiments for unit operations, you're not developing your process, you're not developing your target, you're not building the process understanding. It's essential that you use design of experiments in today's modern filings. Anybody that's not doing that puts their program at risk. Uh, everybody else is up and running doing it and it just is, uh, would be sad to not see you do it. The program that, uh, by the way, I get paid nothing for this next comment, but there are multiple programs that can do design of experiments. Um, Minitab can do it, Statistica can do it, um, uh, Design Expert can do it, um, and there's a bunch of others, some other ones out of Sweden that can do it. The one we think is the best at doing it is SAS Jump. Uh, we get nothing for that comment. Uh, we don't get any royalties. We don't get paid anything for that. But we think that SAS Jump is the solution for a design of experiments. And the reason why is because it's the only one that can do everything. It really has all the tools for stability. It has all the tools for the analytical method. It has all the tools for the process sciences. And um, it can generate all the reports that the agencies are used to. Also, the FDA themselves use SAS Jump in their CMC reviews. So when they analyze data, they pull up SAS Jump and they do it in SAS Jump. So we're on the same platform that the regulatory folks are using. When they see our submissions, when they see them done in SAS Jump, it looks right to them. So it's an advantage to have them on that platform. I'm not saying you couldn't do proper experiments with other software, you could, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, but if you want to talk to me more about that, I can. But that's just for your information, and you'll see all my examples are done on using SAS, using Jump. Um, and they have all the stuff here in Korea as well, and they, it's all in the Korean language as well, so it works well. It's in Chinese too, the people in China use it quite extensively as well, so it's good. Um, process analytical technology is one of our other key strategies. A lot of people have thought that that means only in situ monitoring, and that's not true. Uh, it's for feed-forward, feedback, and in-situ, so it's used in three ways. And then process robustness. Okay, so again, knowledge. Let's see if we want to show some examples. Um, let's, look at, look, let's look at analytical methods. So well-characterized drug product and substance, analytical method, and bioassay. So let's take a look at that. How many of you really think your methods are good? Your analytical methods are good. How many of you are in love with your analytical methods? Do you think that they're fantastic and that the people that develop them really are great? How many of you think that the analytical methods need some work? That's a question. How many of you are happy with the analytical methods? How many of you think they need some work? 
our number one problem today in drug is analytical methods. They're not well developed and they're not well controlled. If the method's not well developed and method's not well controlled, what's going to happen to the drug? It's a direct consequence of the method. So this thing that I'm going to talk about right here is critical in the overall concept. So a good way to think about it is having phase-appropriate development of the method. So in the early phase, what should you do when you're just measuring clinical materials? What should be there? So these are some things that should be present. In phase, by the time you get to phase one, you should have completed something called uh, pre-validation. I think the term qualified method is a bad term. Quali somebody, the, oh, well, we have qualified methods. What does that really mean? It means nothing. Why doesn't it mean, there's no guidance that talks about method qualification. There is no such thing as a qualified method. And I can show you FDA presentations that talk about there is no definition for a qualified method. So when somebody says, I have qualified the method, we now know nothing. We don't know what they've done. It means nothing. It has no definition. It has no guidance. There's only one guidance we have, and that's called a method validation. That we have. So I think it's useful to talk about pre-validation and then talk about validation as the, the concept. So you can demonstrate in the qualification or the pre-validation that it should be validatable. And then in the validation, we, we would show that it's been validated. And then finally, tech transfer. So there's kind of phase appropriate. Now, every analytical method also can create a design space. And what that can show you is it can show you how the accuracy and the precision of the method is directly relating to your OOS rates. So you can plug that in and you can actually see where the accuracy and precision of your method fall and what, how big is that window where the method will be accurate and precise and at what point will that thing fall off and actually create a high OOS rate. So this is something, if you, if you thought about design space for process, there's also a design space for the analytical method. This is a typical workflow for an analytical method. So again, CQAs, define your limits. Um, let, me, let me tie one more line of sight thought to you. When somebody set, defines the acceptance criteria for an analytical method, it's very, very common that this is done very badly. So let me give you uh, just one idea here on this, on this point. Um, I think this might help you. So a lot of times people use CV, percent CV, as the method way of saying, okay, as long as the CV is less than 10%, or as long as the recovery for accuracy is, is 95 or 98 or 99%, it's a good method. This is absolutely a lie. A completely wrong, completely wrong concept and does not really follow any guidance. So a lot of times people will use CV and they'll use recovery as a relative measure of a method's goodness. This is nonsense. It's crazy talk. And it's an old thing that's been circulating around the analytical community for many, many years. Um, guidance says if you're going to talk about recovery or you're going to talk about CV of a method, report only. Include that in your report, but just make it a report only. Why is it a lie? Because at high concentrations, the CV will be very small. And at low concentrations, the CV will blow up because you're dividing by the average. So that doesn't mean that it's not repeatable at low concentrations. It might be fantastic at low concentrations. And that doesn't mean it's good at high concentrations. It might be terrible at high concentrations. So CV is a liar. It's a cheater. It tells you things that are completely wrong about your analytical chemistry. And it is the most common mistake we find in drug development today. So this un this lack of understanding, and it has no CQA relevance. Hmm. So what do we do? You've got to change the equation. And I can talk more to you if, you if you're interested in this, but you have to divide it not by the average. You have to divide it by the CQA limits, the tolerance. If you take the actual variation and divide it by the tolerance, you get a percentage of tolerance. And that has CQA relevance. And then it will tell you if the method is fit for use, if the method is fit for purpose, and whether you should use it for that particular drug development. So we really have to step back and look at these analytical chemistry 
and look at the bioassay and really think again on how we demonstrate that that analytical method is fit for purpose and fit for use in evaluating drug and make the connection back to the CQA. Otherwise, when I do CV or recovery, no connection. Tying it back to the specification limits, line of sight. Fit for use, fit for purpose. So even though that's our tradition, that's not our future. In the future, we'll not be using CVs or recovery as the measure of analytical goodness. It's the wrong measure. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay. I feel lunch is coming on me. I can't wait for it any longer. So 12.50, lunch. We'll start again at 1.50 or 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock.